Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for your attendance. My name is uh, Thamir Al Isa. I'm a consultant endocrinologist, head of division at Jabir Al Ahmed Hospital uh, in Kuwait. I uh, would like to welcome you to the oral session. Uh, I'm joined today with my colleague, Dr. Huda Azzuddin Mustafa. Uh, she's a consultant in the diabetes endocrinology, director of the academic affair at the Health Plus Center for Diabetes and Endocrinology in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we would like to welcome you to the oral session. Uh, this is an, a session for uh, five oral presentations uh, submitted as abstracts, selected by the abstract committee in the, uh, in the GEET conference. And uh, they were pre-presenting their data in this uh, presentation. Uh, we will have five oral uh, presentations delivered to you today. Uh, each presentation will be eight minutes for uh, presentation of the data plus two minutes for discussion, we would like, uh, welcome your uh, questions regarding the presentation to be written in the Q&A box. I uh, would be glad to present them to the speakers uh, to get the information needed. Um, the, the best of those uh, five presentation orals will, uh, will be selected and will be presented in awards uh, at the end of the closing remarks in today's uh, uh, end of the Congress. So without much delay, uh, let me start with the, our first presenter, so our first presenter is Dr. Walid Kaplan. He's a consultant endocrinologist uh, at uh, Tawam Hospital in Ain in UAE. Uh, and his presentation will be, or abstract presentation, will be about short stature assessment and referral in the Gulf region. Uh, Dr. Walid, you have eight minutes. You can start. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the abstract committee for giving me the opportunity of presenting the results of our survey. Um, it is well known that the effect of growth hormone treatment on the final height outcome is uh, relating positively with the duration of treatment and negatively with the age of the patient. In another meaning, the younger the child at the onset of treatment and the longer the duration of treatment, the better the outcome. In spite of that, global information from growth hormone registries and large studies indicate that growth hormone treatments start later or much later than recommended, which reflects negatively on the final height. And it is thought that the delay in referring the cases, the cases from primary care physician is the main contributing factor to this delay in treatment. A group of senior pediatric endocrinologists in the Gulf region wanted to analyze this in our region. So we have, a, we have created a 22 multiple choice question survey the first part of the survey was intended to evaluate the clinical background of the respondent to ensure credibility, the credibility of the generated information. And the rest of the survey was focused on the potential causes of the late referral related to the assessment of short stature, perception of growth hormone indication, safety and efficacy, and the approval of treatment by insurance companies. The target participants were general pediatricians, family practitioner, and pediatric subspecialists, with the exception of pediatric endocrinologists, of course. And the survey was open for a, a period of 30 days. We have received 640 responses, out of which 450 have answered the whole 22 questions. And we have summarized the results in the following slides. So responses by country, you can see that Saudi Arabia has the largest number of uh, responses followed by UAE, Kuwait, and then Oman, Qatar, and Bahrain. More than 65% of the respondents are general pediatricians or pediatric subspecialists, and almost 80% of them reported having more than 10 years of clinical experience, which confirms the credibility of information provided in this survey. 75% of them reported working in a government hospital, and 75% of them were member of a multi-specialty group. The definition of short stature was answered correctly by more than 80% of the responses using either the height standard deviation score or the height percentile I showed in the uh, slide. And of almost 90% of them reported using either the WHO growth chart, the CDC growth chart, or the locally generated national growth chart, and all these options are considered acceptable. However, we asked them how they measure the height of the children in their practice. And as you can see in this slide, less than 50% of them reported using the wall-mounted studiometer, either exclusively or partially, while more than 50% of them 
use the weight scale with the extended height measuring arm, or even 6% reported not measuring the height at all, but taking the height from external source. In this question, we have listed nine clinical conditions. Seven of them are FDA-approved indication for growth hormone treatment, and two are not. And we asked the participant to choose which one of those conditions would they refer to pediatric endocrinologists for growth hormone treatment. And as you can see, only growth hormone deficiency was selected with high percentage, while many of the FDA-approved indications was, were selected by 50% or less of the participants. And we asked furthermore, do you consider growth hormone treatment an option for children with short stature? Less than 60% responded positively. And a second question about the safety of growth hormone for children with short stature, and only 60% of the respondents reported positively about the safety of growth hormone, which leave 40% of the participants either not agreeing with the statement or not sure about them. The last question was about the insurance coverage for growth hormone. And as you can see in the slide, 44% of those working in a government hospital confirmed a coverage of growth hormone for all the cases. 25% reported sometimes coverage, while 30% were either not sure or reported no coverage for growth hormone. It's much worse for the private sector, where only 6.5% reported the coverage is confirmed always, 31%, sometimes coverage, and about 52%, not sure about the coverage. So in summary, the vast majority of the primary care physicians use the correct definition of short stature and the proper growth chart. However, less than 30% are measuring height correctly in their practice. 50% of them lack awareness of the approved indication of growth hormone. 60% or less consider growth hormone an option to treat short stature, and only 60% perceive growth hormone treatment as safe, and apparently treatment coverage by payer is reported by 50% or less as definite. Our conclusion that the delay in referring children with short stature could be due to one or more of the following reasons. Number one, incorrect measurement of height, which lead to missing some cases knowledge gap about the approved indication of growth hormone, misperception about growth hormone safety or efficacy by primary care physicians, and lack of treatment approved by payer. We identify a significant knowledge gaps from this survey that should be addressed by a former and structured educational effort about the assessment of short stature and the safety and efficacy of growth hormone treatment. I would like to acknowledge the contribution of my colleague from the Gulf countries, listed in the alphabetical order, and also Angie Romani, the senior medical manager of the rare disease in Pfizer company. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Walid, for this presentation. Appreciate the contribution. Um, if there's any question, I see there might be a question. Um, yes, there is a question from audience, Dr. Walid, um, saying, uh, was growth hormone stimulation before treatment was asked? And if so, what were the results? Thank you. We have asked about the diagnostic workup they uh, use, and uh, about 60% of them, if I remember the percentage correctly, reported uh, a growth hormone stimulation test as one of the tests. And uh, I'm not getting any other questions. Uh, Dr. Huda, do you want to add that you have a question? Um, thank you very much, Dr. Walid, for the well-organized and clear presentation. Um, of course, whenever there is a survey presented, number one question is about the survey tool, whether it's been validated or used before. I'm so, sorry, can you, can you explain so, again? <laughs> so it, it's regarding the tool, the, the, the survey tool that you have used. Has it been validated or do you have a reference for it? Well, we use the survey monkey and again, we've, uh, we've come together to put the questions that uh, their answers would indicate the uh, potential area that we were questioning, but it was SurveyMonkey that answers your question. Uh, so SurveyMonkey would do the analysis, but the actual validation of the, of the questions uh, is probably peer through peers. And yeah, and yeah. As, as I said in the beginning, it was the, the advisors from the uh, six Gulf countries that we've met twice uh, formatting the survey. We have deleted some questions. We have revised other questions. 
to make sure that the answers are as objective as possible. And one more question. Um, have you noticed any knowledge gap differences um, amongst participating centers? Yeah, we haven't uh, done a sub-analysis to look at the different countries. That is something probably might be needed when we plan to do the educational uh, campaign to address the areas that might be different in different areas. Thank you very much, Dr. Walid. Sure. Thank you. Victor, I might have um, uh, maybe one or two questions. Um, with, with the, if you're considering writing up this, uh, this information in terms of article and you want to do a discussion about challenges related to diagnosis and therapy, where you would find the challenges are in, in that part with, with your survey? Among physicians. Well, I was, I was surprised when the simplest thing that we were expecting to be done was not met, which is a simply measuring the chart uh, height correctly by using a Walmart and studiometer. In my practice, I receive good number of cases that I basically sign off simply by measuring the height of the child and then find it being normal against what the primary care physician found. But on the other extreme, that they might actually overestimate the height and missing cases of short stature. This is very simple and it can be addressed and fixed correctly. However, the approved indications, we have now eight approved indication for growth hormone by FDA, and apparently growth hormone deficiency is the only one that is known by majority of primary care physician. So this need to be addressed as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Walid. I think we're almost done with your presentation of the time allocated. So thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Uh, I would like also to uh, 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 welcome uh, our uh, also member of the uh, oral committee uh, uh, evaluation, Dr. Ali Al Karni, joining us. Um, he's a consultant endocrinologist at King Abdulaziz Hospital, Ministry of National Guard Health Affairs. Uh, he's also going to be uh, taking rounds and uh, presenting the speakers for tonight. Uh, Dr. Huda, go ahead for the next talk. Sure. So the next presentation um, is about the risk factors associated with progression of diabetes uh, neuropathy. And for that, we have Dr. Uh, Georgios uh, uh, Ponirakis from Doha, uh, Will Cornell Medicine, Qatar. So the uh, floor is yours, Dr. Georgios. You have eight minutes. Hi, from Qatar. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee, the Gulf Association of the Technology and Diabetes for giving us the opportunity to present the work done here in Qatar. So the title of my work is about looking at the risk factors associated with progression of diabetic neuropathy. Um, there are limited longitudinal studies that have assessed the, the association between risk factors and the evolution of diabetic neuropathy. Currently, there are no drugs FDA approved for uh, diabetic neuropathy. So we're treating the risk factors that are associated with diabetic neuropathy. So the things we look at, it was uh, to assess the association of diabetic neuropathy, painful diabetic neuropathy in patients with type 2 diabetes over two years, looking at risk factors, including age, duration of diabetes, obesity, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, microalbinuria, weight, and physical inactivity. That's for the baseline. And also we look at for the association of changes in HB1C, body weight, waist circumference, BMI, lipid profile, blood pressure, albumin creatine ratio, and the association of anti-diabetic drugs that induce weight gain and physical activity over the two years with changes in corneal confocal microscopy, which I'm going to explain in a moment, changes in the vibration perception threshold, and also with neuropathic symptoms. This is a two-year prospective study involving Hamad Jan Hospital, Diabetes Clinic, and Well Cornell Medicine here in Qatar. And these are the PI of this study. The inclusion criteria was patients with type 2 diabetes, aged between 18 and 70, healthy controls in the same age range with a HB1C lower than, 40, uh, lower than 6%. And the exclusion criteria we included was anemia, renal failure, all the causes of neuropathy other than diabetic neuropathy, including immune disease, infections, inherited disease, and inflammatory disease. We also had to exclude patients with severe dry eyes, corneal dystrophies, ocular trauma surgery, uh, preceding six months before the assessment for the corneal confocal microscopy test. These are the risk factors that we examined, and here's where I define, how we define them. 
worth mentioning for the physical inactivity and activity, we use the global physical activity questionnaire version two. And for anti-diabetic medications that induce weight gain, we include insulin, fluorinia, TCD, and for weight loss, metformin, GLP-1, and SGLT-2 inhibitors. For the vibration perception threshold, we apply in the large toe, and we measure the perception to feel vibration. For neuropathic symptoms, including burning pain, painful cold, electric shocks, tingling, pins and needles, numbness in the feet, we use the DNPO questionnaire. And we define the bit neuropathy based on one symptom or more, and with a VPT equal or higher than 15 volts. For painful diabetic neuropathy, we use the DN4 questionnaire with a score equal to or higher than four uh, points out of 10. Now, let me illustrate a little bit about the CCM. This is the device we use to examine the eyes, to look at the nerves in the cornea, and we measure the nerve fiber density, branch density, and the total length of the fibers using uh, software to, for objective quantification of these parameters. There's a slight touch there of the eye. And this is how the nerves looks like in the cornea, the white lines. Okay, so we recruited 78 subjects with type two diabetes with a duration of diabetes 13 years, 26 healthy controls. They were age matched and sex matched. In the type two diabetes cohort, the prevalence of poor glycemic control was 92%, obesity was 65%, physical inactivity, 58%, hyperlipidemia, 22%, hypertension, 21%, microbilinuria, 28%. In terms of duration of diabetes, those who were less, had less than 10 years of diabetes with 29%, those who had diabetes duration between 10 to 19 years, 45%, and those more than 20 years, 26%. The prevalence of diabetic neuropathy was 18%, and for painful diabetic neuropathy, 26%. Those who were on the anti-diabetic drugs was 75%, and those who were that induced weight gain, and those who were on diabetic drugs that induced weight loss were 89%. Now, looking here on our first table, where I'm illustrating the demographics, physical active, um, sorry, clinical characteristics, and neuropathy measures. When we look at the baseline data, and we want to compare between healthy controls and type 2 patients, there was significant difference in H1C, lipid profile, body weight, and BMI. And when we look at the neuropathy measures, starting with the cornea convocal microscopy, we can see that there was a significant lower nerve fibers uh, in uh, branch density and fiber length in the type 2 cohort compared to healthy controls. And with the vibration perception threshold, Patients with type 2 had a higher uh, per vibration perception threshold compared to health controls. In the next column, where we look at the changes over the two years, we notice that there is a moderate improvement in H1C in type 2 patients. Uh, there is also an improvement in LDL. Uh, there was a slight reduction in body weight in type two patients. And when we look at the uh, corneal cofocal microscopy, the corneal nerve morphology, we see that um, there, is a, there is a significant reduction in the branch density here and in the fiber length. Not so much, it wasn't, it was, there was a reduction, but not significant in a fiber density. There was no change in the vibration perception threshold but there was an improvement in the neuropathic symptoms within these two years in type two patients. Now, next thing, we'll look at the association of the risk factors baseline with the baseline neuropathy measures. And we see that the cornea neuromorphology had no association with any of the risk factors at baseline. Duration of diabetes and physical inactivity was associated with higher vibration perception threshold and AIDS and anti-diabetic drugs that induce weight gain were associated with higher, with more neuropathic symptoms. Next, looking at the changes in the neuropathy measures, whether they had any association with the risk factors, our data shows that physical inactivity 
was associated with changes in the fiber density, with reduction in fiber density, and with reduction in fiber length. That is um, after we adjusted for all the co-founding factors that were associated with, uh, with the neuropathy measures. Duration diabetes was associated with uh, reduction in branch density. We didn't find any association within the two year period of any risk factors on vibration perception threshold. Um, what we noticed that uh, patients who were at baseline having painful diabetic neuropathy based on the DN4 questionnaire were associated with an improvement in neuropathic symptoms at follow up. And just to illustrate better the association of physical activity, inactivity, or inactivity with uh, changes in neuropathy measures, first of all, we see that in healthy controls between baseline and two year follow up, there was no significant change either in fiber density, branch density, or fiber length. When we look at those who were fiscally inactive in type 2 patients, we see that there was a significant uh, reduction in all parameters, in the fiber density, branch density, and in the fiber length. Whereas those who were fiscally active, we noticed there was no significant change in the fiber density and in fiber length, but there was a significant reduction in branch density. And this graph illustrates Again, this change, the association of physical inactivity and activity. So the, the black bars illustrate the healthy controls. The red bars illustrate those who are physically inactive. And the blue bars, those who are physically active in, in the type 2 cohort. And looking at the fiber density, we can see there's only significant reduction within two years in those who are physically inactive. The same with the branches and fiber length. Whereas with, the five, with those who are physically active, only with the brand stents, we found a significant reduction. So to conclude, um, there was a modest improvement in H1C, body weight, and LDL cholesterol in type 2 patients in our cohort. No change in the prevalence of diabetic neuropathy or painful diabetic neuropathy or vibration perception threshold within a two-year period. However, there was a progressive nerve loss, reduction in brand stents fiber length in physically inactive patients. And so physical inactivity may limit the progression of diabetic neuropathy. That's our conclusion. And I'd like to thank our sponsor, Qatar National Research Fund, who sponsored our study. These are the investigators, all of them who were involved in this study. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Georgios, for the interesting presentation. Um, I'm sure this will attract some discussion. Um, let me just start by asking you a few things. So are those um, assessment methods for DPN um, are done routinely or are just done for the study case? For the study case, yeah. Well, um, something that Dr. Imad will present later, uh, they start applying the vibration perception threshold, uh, looking at uh, patients who are at risk of developing diabetic neuropathy in Hamad General Hospital, but no, not the CCM, not the corneal. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Dr. Tamer, if you have any other question, because we're quite short um, in time. Um, otherwise, I have other questions, if you would allow. Uh, I think we're running out of time, so we can give uh, uh, equal time uh, with uh, every presentation. I think Dr. Ali can uh, present the next yeah. presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon. Do you hear me well? Thank you. Uh, it gives me the pleasure to present the third abstract prevalence and predictors of hypogonadism recovery in men with macroblactinemas treated with dopamine agonist presented by Dr. Uh, Aisha al khazemi uh, consultant chronologist in uh, Saudi University. Good afternoon. Um, uh, I would like to thank the, uh, the abstract community uh, for giving me the opportunity to present, to present this work on behalf of my colleague, uh, who participated participated in this study. Uh, the work was led by Dr. Khalid Dahmani, um, and it's an honor to present it during this prestigious meeting. Um, it, it is about the prevalence and the predictors of hypogonadism recovery in men with macroprolactinoma treated with dopamine um, agonist. Uh, these are the outline of my, uh, my presentation. We know that hyperprolactinemia 
um, uh, is common. It forms about 50% uh, of, uh, of, of all the pituitary tum tumor, the functional type. Prolactin is an anterior pituitary hormone, which has a uh, main principle of physiological role and action in initiation and maintenance of lactation. Um, besides the other causes of uh, hyperblactinoma, we know that drugs, chronic illness can affect the prolactin level. Here I'm focusing on uh, macro, um, uh, macro prolactinoma related to the pituitary tumor. We know micro prolactinoma, less than one centimeter is common in women. Macro prolactinoma, more common in men, uh, more than one centimeter in size. The reason that men usually present late because of their subtle presentation um, uh, of erectile dysfunction and hypogonadism. And when the issue comes to infertility, they come usually late. So for that reason, they present with macroadenoma. Uh, the common presentation of macroprolactinoma in men, either due to the tumor mass effect that cause visual field defects and headache, um, or um, a symptom related to hypogonadism as, uh, hypogonadism, as I mentioned earlier, decreased libido, erectile dysfunction, and, and, and infertility. Um, what is reported in the literature that uh, hypogonadism in patients with macroprolactinoma in male, it forms about 75% at the time of the diagnosis. Due to the either due to uh, prolactin level effect on uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone suppression, causing hypogonadism, or direct effects of the tumor on gonadotrop cells causing destruction of the cell and causing hypogonadism. Uh, in different studies, uh, the report of hypogonadism, the prevalence of hypogonadism at a presentation at the time of diagnosis uh, was variable between 50 to 93% uh, most of the time. The goal when we treat patient, male patient with uh, hyperprolactinemia related to macroprolactinoma is to restore uh, eugonadism status on those patients by normalizing, uh, by normalizing prolactin level and uh, tumor mass reduction. Um, we have noticed that even it was published before in a small number of studies, if you can see here, um, the number of the patients uh, included in those studies is small, uh, that the prevalence of hypogonadism at the time of a presentation is about uh, is about uh, it's variable between uh, fifty uh, between fifty uh, to ninety percent, and those with persistent hypogonadism actually uh, between forty to sixty percent. So the reason uh, we are presenting this is to find out the prevalence of hypogonadism in our area, a region of hypogonadism in male patients with macroprolactinoma, and uh, the predictors of recovery. Uh, because it's very important to early identify patients who are likely to recover from hypogonadism to avoid un unnecessary testosterone replacement, and also to identify th those patients who need testosterone replacement earlier to avoid complications related to hypogonadism. So as I said earlier, data are limited regarding the prevalence, especially in our region, the prevalence and the predictors of persistent hypogonadism after treating patients with dopamine agonist. Um, and uh, most of the studies that were published, uh, there were small numbers of studies with small number uh, of patients, and uh, they were involved, uh, it they were single center study. So we decided to uh, do a multi center study to evaluate the prevalence of hypogonadism in men with macroprolactinoma treated exclusively, exclusively with dopamine agonist, and also to determine the predictors of recovery or hypothal hypothalamus pituitary uh, gonadal axis following dopamine agonist therapy. Uh, so it's um, a multi center retrospective study of male patients with macroprolactinoma treated with uh, dopamine agonist. Uh, between 2009 uh, to 2019, so over 10 years. Uh, the participating centers in the Gulf region, two centers from United Arab Emirates, Tawam Hospital and Dubai Hospital, and three centers from uh, Saudi Arabia, King Fahad Medical City, King Saud uh, University Medical City, and National Guard Hospital. The cases were identified based on ICD-9 and 10 codes. So macroprolactinoma cases were considered in patient, male patient with macroadenoma, and prolactin level more than 2,000 international units per liter with radiological and biochemical evidence of response to dopamine agonist. Patient with microprolactinoma, 
patients with macroprolactin or molecular additional therapy like surgery and radiotherapy, or those patients presented with clinical apoplexy were excluded from the study. We collected the baseline data, the age of the patient at presentation, year of diagnosis, uh, presenting symptoms uh, related to uh, macroprolactinoma in terms of mass effect or symptoms related to hypogonadism like infertility, erectile dysfunction, and decreased libido. Um, tumor side at presentation based on the radiological uh, imaging. Type of domain agonist used, bromocryptin or cabergoline, duration of therapy in years. Tumor size post therapy and also hormonal profile post therapy during phys physician assessment of the patient and during follow up period. So there were 101 patients included. 24 patients were excluded from the study because those patients had surgery, either they had surgery, had clinical apoplexy, or uh, we didn't have enough data uh, about their clinical information or presentation. 85 patients uh, were included in the study. Uh, looking at the result here, um, so clinical characteristic, characteristic of the patient. So the median age of the patient at the presentation was 33. Um, and the tumor side median at the presentation was 2.7 centimeter. So uh, we classify a different uh, size of the tumor and the number of the patient uh, based on the tumor size. Most of them actually between 2 to 3.9 centimeter in terms of the size of the tumor at the presentation. A duration of the therapy, uh, therapy were calculated uh, in years. Medium was six, median was six years. Uh, most of the patients who used, uh, they used uh, uh, uh during, uh, as a medical therapy for the uh, hyperprolactinemia. Two or three patients used promocryptin. Uh, Commonest presentation was headache, the main presentation, 75% of the patient, um, followed by uh, erectile dysfunction, 55%, then lib decreased libido and visual disturbance. So um, regarding the hypogonadism at the time of a presentation, so the prevalence was 75.6% uh, at the time of the diagnosis in terms of the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism at the presentation, followed by growth hormone deficiency, which was 35%. Percent and then hypothyroidism, uh, fourteen percent. So we were evaluating the other pituitary hormonal deficiency during assessment of patients with macroprolactinoma. Lega regarding the uh, median level of prolactin at the time of the presentation, it was twenty thousands. Uh, maximum was five hundred thousands uh, in terms of the level. If we look at the minimum and, maxi and maximum range of prolactin level. Um, regarding the testosterone at the uh, time of the presentation, median level was four point four. Um, and it can be low uh, between 0.5, upper limit was 28 uh, for some patients. Uh, what about uh, the factor related to hypogonadism recovery? Um, we found out that 65% of those patients with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism at a presentation recovered their gonadal axis, where 35% actually still having uh, persistent uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Um, if you see here in terms of the uh, uh, prolactin level at the time of presentation, those who recovered the, the, the median level of, at the time of presentation was 18,000, lower compared to those who didn't recover. So the higher level at the time of presentation, 63,000 uh, here, as, as you can see here, um, compared to the lower level at the time of presentation, it predicts the recovery of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism um, uh, after medical therapy. Even looking at the testosterone level, those who recovered hypogonadotropic hypogonadism after medical therapy tend to have higher level. The median was 4.6 compared to those who didn't recover after giving them uh, medical therapy. If you look at the other um, um, axis, like uh, there was higher chance of recovery of uh, growth hormone axis and hypothyroid uh, axis if they actually um, uh, uh, recover their gonadal axis. Uh, even if you look at the tumor size, those uh, patients who recovered their gonadal axis tend to have a smaller size of the tumor uh, it was between 2 to 3.9, so it's in general less than 3 uh, centimeter. Compared to those who didn't recover the gonadal, uh, the hypogonadism, they tend to have a uh, larger uh, tumor size of 4 uh, centimeter and more. Uh, so this is actually the largest. When we look back at the literature, we found 
uh, that this is the largest study to include larger number of the patient uh, to assist the prevalence and recovery of hypogonadism in men with macroprolactinoma treated with medical therapy. The prevalence, as I said, of hypogonadism at presentation 76.5 and recover, uh, recovery, um, the percentage of recovery after medical therapy was 65%, similar to what uh, have been published uh, in different studies. If you look at this uh, uh, table, you can see different studies by, uh, published by uh, many authors um, over the last uh, 15 years. And the recent one, one by Sihambi uh, in 2020, they included a small number of patients compared to our study. Compared to the percentage, hypogonadism was 75%, uh, similar to, uh, similar, almost similar to the other uh, studies. And the persistent and recovery of hypogonadism was 65%, almost similar to what have been published, but there was variability in the, uh, in the percentage because of the uh, co-founding factor affecting hypogonadism at that time. Uh, looking at the tumor size, we found that tumor size um, a 3.9 uh, centimeter and less uh, is a good predictor of recovery of hypogonadism in patients with uh, macroprolactinoma. Um, here at the time of recovery, we found that the patients um, uh, recovered uh, their gonadal axis uh, almost within uh, uh, 48 months, uh, uh, sorry, almost within 24 months, and the latest was 48 months. This, uh, the strength of the study, it was the largest one to include larger number of patients um, at with dopamine agonist and confirm uh, what has been what have been published before uh, in the smaller number of uh, patients uh, that the prevalence of hypogonadism is almost between 65 uh, to 90 percent and recovery is about uh, 40 to 60 percent. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, we defined the predictors that was not identified before. The predictor of recovery, tumor size, the smaller size, the uh, higher recovery rate. Uh, and also the baseline level of prolactin. The lower the level of prolactin at the presentation, the higher chance of recovery. Our limitation is retrospective study, non-systematic evaluation of prolactin level and other hormone. Um, we didn't have data about the time of the hormonal evaluation, was it in the morning during the day or late during the day? And also we didn't consider the confounding factor that affects hypogonadism besides uh, prolactinoma, like uh, diabetes, comorbidities, or all other patients, and also different essays based on the and different centers. So it was uh, there was variability in the term. So in conclusion, 65% of men with macroplactinoma recovered their gonadal access after treating them with medical therapy. Predictor of hypogonadism recovery, smaller adenoma size, lower plaquenil level, higher testosterone level at presentation, a lower low rate of hypogonadism uh, and a presentation related to hypogonadism recovery. So we need further prospective study to evaluate this and assess the tumor size as a kind of, uh, point to predict recovery uh, and also identify confounding factors that affect hypogonadism in those patients. I would like to ask to, uh, to thank my colleague, uh, the primary uh, investigator, Dr. Khaled Zetmani, who read this uh, work, uh, uh, and also my colleague from uh, Gulf country from the United Arab Emirates, Dr. Musa Malki from uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Dr. Mabber, uh, Dr. Alad Din Bashir, and uh, Dr. Satish. Thank you so much. Uh, we go back for our uh, next uh, presenter for the next presentation, um, uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Ghamdi. Uh, Dr. Ahmed is a consultant endocrinologist at uh, King Fahad uh, Medical City in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, his presentation is going to be about the thyroid one stop clinic for newly referred patients with thyroid nodules. Dr. Ahmed, you can start your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thamer, and thank you for the committee to choose uh, my uh, um, abstract for the oral presentation. Uh, so uh, Thyroid One Stop Clinic is an emerging new approach in providing an integrative diagnostic and therapeutic care for thyroid nodules patients. That has been shown to save cost and time compared to the conventional approach. What do we mean by conventional approach? Five uh, visits, uh, uh, at least in our institute, the first visit, the patient will come to the clinic, will be assessed and examined by the primary doctor, and the second visit, uh, blood test and ultrasound thyroid would be done. Then the patient will come for the third time to the clinic, and the doctor will see the results for the blood test and the ultrasound, and they will order, uh, the doctor will order the ultrasound, uh, uh, fine needle aspiration, uh, usually through the uh, 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 interventional uh, radiology department. Then the patient 
will come for the fifth time to the clinic for the definitive management plan. Uh, the thyroid one stop clinic that was uh, initiated in 2017, uh, the pathway of it is as follows. The patient would arrive to the clinic, TFT will be done. Uh, usually it would take uh, about one to uh, two hours uh, duration uh, to result. And then based on the TFT, if the TSH is low, usually we will repeat uh, or we will uh, uh, send the patient to the nuclear medicine, but uh, the approach would be appro aborted. If the uh, TSH is high or normal, then bedside ultrasonography for the thyroid would be done. And based on the thyroid uh, 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 nodules criteria, uh, the ultrasound FNA would be conducted. And then cytology assessment usually will be done also inside the clinic by the DIFQUIC initially, and then later sent to the uh, uh, laboratory for the uh, PAP stain. Uh, and final decision would be uh, taken for the uh, thyroid uh, uh, nodule based on the um, uh, assessment uh, of the uh, uh, cytology. So the aim of this study is to measure the effectiveness of this approach in terms of the time and cost reduction compared to the conventional way that takes usually, as we said, five visits, in addition to the uh, assessment or measure the safety of this new approach. Uh, the uh, study was prospective study that uh, involved um, uh, uh, the comparison between these two arms, the thyroid one-stop clinic and the conventional. It's carried out at KFMC uh, Thyroid Clinic in Riyadh uh, in period between uh, 2017 and 2020. The inclusion criteria for the patients, they were adult, age 18 or more. The TSH, as we mentioned earlier, would be needed to be normal or high. There will be need uh, for the ultrasound for the presence of thyroid nodule or nodules that are applicable for FNA according to the ATA and or the ACR TIRAS criteria. And finally, the consent. The exclusion criteria would be pediatric age uh, less than 18 because we don't uh, treat pediatric patients. Uh, suppressed TSH uh, less than 0.35 in our um, uh, million uh, in our uh, like uh, institutional laboratory and cooperative patients or uh, if they are on uh, uh, active anticoagulant medications. The primary outcome from this is to measure the total amount of time taken from the first visit to the final diagnosis and decision. The second primary outcome was the cost spent by the patients, and it was estimated at the end of their journey based on a questionnaire. The secondary outcome, biopsy disclosure time, we mean the time from the FNA to the final uh, uh, or to the clinical decision. The second uh, secondary outcome, the patient experience overall satisfaction, satisfaction rate, and that's also assist through the so the uh, the second secondary outcome was the patient experience of uh, overall satisfaction rate that's usually uh, also uh, assist uh, through the questionnaire and the third uh, secondary outcome was the severe complication rate that is uh, assist uh, at the end of the procedure uh, clinically uh, the statistical analysis was done through the SPSS software, and um, we used, uh, uh, as we all know, uh, the continue for the uh, t-test for the continuous variables, while the chi-square test for the categorical variables comparison, the statistical significance was set to be less than 0.05. This is the baseline characteristics. So uh, the age, there was no significant difference between the age in two uh, uh, arms. Uh, the gender or for females percentage also was not significant. The number of visit five uh, uh, versus one number of patients according to the place of residence uh, from the central region, we mean Riyadh and Riyadh, uh, Riyadh city and Riyadh region. Uh, there were 66 percent versus 75 in the uh, thyroid one stop clinic. North uh, uh, region, there were 20 percent in the conventional uh, uh, arm, while uh, 10 percent only in the thyroid one stop clinic. And the south was 13 versus uh, 15 uh, percent. So here are uh, our results. So the time taken from the first uh, uh, visit till the decision, uh, the conventional, uh, conventional clinic. And I, had, I have uh, to say also that those patients were taken all from all the clinics. I mean, they were randomly assigned from all the clinics, all consultants in the institution uh, uh, taking care of endocrinology and dealing with such thyroid nodules issues. So the time taken was 138 days, uh, the mean in the conventional uh, group, while in the thyroid one-stop clinic was 2.5 because we need also to 
uh, count the uh, dates uh, uh, for the pap smear, pap, um, pap, uh, sorry, pap stain that's sent to the laboratory for, uh, uh, for the final diagnosis from uh, the pathologist. And it was clearly uh, uh, significantly different. Uh, the estimated uh, cost by the patient, uh, per patient, was uh, uh, in Saudi Riyal was 3,566 in conventional group versus only 408 Riyals um, uh, in the, um, as I mean, in the uh, thyroid one stop clinic. Uh, if you can see also, if we fragment the estimated cost per patient, per uh, place of residence per patients, according to the regions of Saudi Arabia, uh, we can see always that there uh, is like uh, uh, significant, uh, statistically significant difference. Uh, if we take Riyadh city, uh, like so the same city we are, uh, Riyadh region, north of KSA, uh, also the south of KSA. The uh, secondary outcome was the biopsy disclosure time that was 20 days uh, plus minus 2.5 as standard deviation in the conventional group and only 2.5 plus minus 1.7 in the thyroid one-stop clinic, which is uh, statistically significant. The overall experience satisfaction rate was 51.25% in the conventional group, while 100% satisfaction rate in the thyroid one-stop uh, clinic. The severe complications rate were, uh, alhamdulillah, zero in uh, both arms. Uh, and then, I don't know if you can see the, the last, uh, arrow, the last uh, like uh, row that I was mentioning about the uh, Bethesda uh, score category, sorry, for both groups, uh, uh, specifically the non-diagnostic, uh, which is category one, that was 5% in the conventional group, while thyroid uh, one-stop clinic 7%, which is not uh, statistically significant. So here, uh, we just put this uh, bar chart uh, uh, for the place of residence uh, and the uh, mean cost in Saudi Riyadh. Uh, Saudi Riyals. And uh, as, uh, as shown earlier, there is like uh, difference according to the region. And you can see the same difference happens with a very reduced amount of uh, cost spent. Here is the satisfaction rate, and uh, uh, it's the mean, as we mentioned, about 51%, while it's 100% uh, in, uh, in the thyroid one-stop clinic. Uh, here, just I want to show you that the, uh, uh, the Bethesda uh, results from both groups, the benign, where like the majority 63 in the uh, one-stop clinic, 73 in the uh, uh, conventional clinic, uh, BTC is almost the same and non-diagnostic uh, uh, also uh, uh, like uh, not significantly different. So here, uh, uh, the, this study is actually the first conducted study of its kind in Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, not, um, I can say also uh, maybe in the Gulf. Uh, there was only one report in the literature by uh, Dr. Patel from Melbourne, Australia, where uh, he is a surgeon and he is doing FNA for his patients. So he reduced, uh, and his group actually reduced the times of patients' visit from three to two. Uh, and their median uh, ultrasound FNA to the definitive management plan was 14 days from 41 uh, days. Um, so the uh, efficacy of the patient is like uh, efficacy of the of the approach is um, uh, as shown is like uh, um, uh, very effective and uh, safe. Uh, while the uh, main limitation here in the uh, uh, this approach is the practicality, uh, which means that this approach needs well training staff, needs well equipped clinics, we, uh, needs also. Um, uh, the policies in the institute to be like well built uh, to uh, make the uh, to to increase or uh, enhance the streamline of the work for the patients and make the uh, those days like to be uh, reduced significantly as well as the cost uh, accordingly. So in conclusion, I would say that the, th the uh, thyroid one-stop clinic approach significantly shortens the journey taken by the newly referred patients with thyroid nodules, is extremely cost-effective and significantly improves the overall patient's experience and satisfaction. However, this approach is always multidisciplinary for uh, uh, that would uh, uh, take care of the uh, patient-centered care, actually, and requires qualified care uh, uh, providers as well as uh, well-equipped uh, uh, clinics. Uh, thank you. And at the end, I want also to thank uh, the, the, my group that worked with me uh, on this uh, approach over the uh, past three years. 
um, uh, pathology uh, nurses um, and um, uh, like they are long list and uh, deeply um, uh, from the heart I thank uh, uh, all of them thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for the presentation. We appreciate your presence with us here. Um, for Also, for the lack of time, unfortunately, we need to move on to our last presentation. Dr. Ahuda? Uh, so the last presentation here, we're having the prevalence of diabetic peripheral neuropathy in the um, Arabian Gulf region. And for that, we have Dr. Imad Burma, who is a consultant endocrinologist at the King Fahad Medical City in Riyadh, uh, who also works in the Obesity and Endocrine Metabolism Department. So Dr. Ahmad, please, you can proceed with your presentation. So I would like to thank the organizing committee of this uh, prestigious conference for giving us an oral presentation. I'm presenting on, be on behalf of the group that has conducted this study from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Kuwait. And basically, we know that diabetic peripheral neuropathy is a devastating, is a devastating uh, complication uh, of diabetes that leads to painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy and diabetic foot ulceration with her both basically unwanted morbidities. When we talk about diabetic uh, foot ulceration, one in four of uh, these patients are at risk of amputations and they have 2.5 increased uh, risk of uh, mortality. And there has been studies done in the Gulf region with regard to the prevalence. Uh, basically, it is in the MENA region uh, regarding the prevalence of DBN, which has widely ranged from 17 to 53 percent. And for painful DPN, also widely ranged from 18 to 65 percent. This was mainly due to different pa patient characteristics, but also different methodology used in the diagnosis of uh, DPN. And we know that identification and treatment of risk factors are really very important uh, step in delaying the development as well as the progression of DBN. So the objectives of this study was to establish the prevalence and risk factors of DPN, that refers to diabetic peripheral neuropathy, painful DPN, and diabetic foot ulceration here referred to as DFU. That was in patients with type 2 diabetes in secondary care health centers in Qatar, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. So this was a trans-Gulf study. And it was a multi-center study, as you've seen the centers, which is a cross-sectional, uh, which has a cross-sectional design. And it was uh, conducted in the period between June 2017 and May 2019. And the lead PI is Professor Riaz Malik, who's a very renowned expert in the field of neuropathy. He's done a lot of uh, clinical investigation and care for these patients also joined by uh, uh, Dr. Georgios Ponirakis, who just presented the, the second study, I think. The second center was also in Qatar, in Hamad Medical Corporation, uh, Dr. Tariq al -Hadi. And the third center was from Kuwait, Dr. Iba al -Razeri. And my humble self was from King Fahad Medical City, of course, with my other colleagues, Dr. Nagy Johani and Dr. Weil, and Dr. Rishwana. Uh, Regarding the, uh, the inclusion criteria for the study, it was type 2 diabetes, adults with age 18 to 85 years of old, excluded type 1 diabetes, and importantly, all other causes of neuropathy, such as vitamin B12 or folate deficiencies, uh, secondary to malignancy, or other causes of neuropathy. And we used the vibration perception uh, threshold through the use of the neurophysiometer. Uh, which is a well-validated tool against uh, nerve conduction studies as well as uh, nerve biopsies in the diagnosis of uh, abnormal VBT. And it is just shown here by Professor Riaz Malik, which is used by actually uh, by you know, placing the probe in the pulp of the light toe and then measuring the, uh, the vibration at three shots three times, and we take the average from both feet. If the normal is less than 15 volts, and the impaired uh, VBT is 15 or more, with those who are scoring 25 or more are at high risk of DFU. The neuropathic symptoms that were uh, captured were burning pain, painful cold, electric shocks, tingling, pins and needles, and numbness. The diagnosis of DPN was made in the presence of at least one neuropathic symptom or more, plus impaired VBT, that's more than 15 volts. 
Painful DPN was diagnosed using the well-validated DNR4 questionnaire, a score of four or more would diagnose uh, patients with painful DPN. And DFU was diagnosed as basically uh, a break in the skin as shown here in the slide. Uh, so it is a break in the skin of the, of the foot that involves the epidermis and or part of the dermis. And again, important definitions before we go to the results, poor glycemic control, A1C more than 7%, hypertension, systolic blood pressure 140 or more, or on antihypertensive medications, hyperlipidemia, total control 6.2 or more millimole per liter, and or triglycerides more than 2.3 millimole, or on statin or fibrin. BMI uh, more than 30 would define obesity, and physical activity was self-reported here and was basically uh, defined as walking for more than 30 minutes a day, at least three times a week over the year preceding the study. Smoking or smokers were defined by smoking at least one cigarette or more per, per day, or like every day for the year uh, preceding the visit. And vitamin D uh, normality was defined as more than 30 nanograms per mil with mild deficiency defined as 20, 29, moderate 10 to, to 19, and severe less than 10 nanogram per milliliter. This is the baseline characteristics of the study population. The first column here is the, the whole cohort from the three Gulf countries, and it is more than 3,000 patients with type 2 diabetes, quite a large number. Here is the demographs of these patients. The age is 57, mean diabetes duration is 14, very long duration. Females constituted 46% of the cohort. And basically, sadly, uh, more than 70% of these patients has poor glycemic control, 75% hyperlipidemia, 65% hypertension, 56% obesity, 33% only were physically active, and around 22% were smokers. Uh, systolic blood pressure was controlled. Mean hemoglobin A1C was around 8.2, and... Basically, the lipid profile looks uh, basically okay for this cohort. There are some uh, inter-country differences here. As you can see, there are more patients from the Saudi Arabia cohort, which is around 760, who had uh, poor control and hyperlipidemia. And we see the numbers from Kuwait is 1,100. And we can see that they have higher uh, rate here of, uh, I think, uh, smokers here and physical inactivity. And basically, uh, the cohort is generally... Uh, well matched in, in terms of, uh, you know, the uh, capture of these data. Now we go to the first uh, graph, which you showed the uh, outcomes of interest. Here, uh, the prevalence in the, y, in the y axis, and we go first with the prevalence of DPN. The gray bar shows the cohort from the three countries merged together, and it is 33%. While we see differences here, uh, the lowest prevalence was reported in Qatar, 23% in red, while Kuwait had uh, the highest 40% and Saudi Arabia in the middle, 35%. There are significant differences, of course, between the countries and Qatar. When we looked at the high risk of diabetic cause ulceration, again, for the total cohort in gray, 52% uh, was the prevalence for uh, this outcome. Again, there were variations between the, between the three countries with the highest uh, reported in Saudi Arabia at 59%, uh, followed by Kuwait, 54%, and then Qatar, 40%. Uh, regarding the diabetic foot ulceration, it is well, actually, it, luckily it was, it was a bit lower than actually the general reported in the world, which is usually 6% 6, 6 or more. So here we see the overall is 2.9. I mean, the overall prevalence is 2.9% which is the same number that reported from Qatar, with Kuwait being slightly less at 2.6% and Saudi Arabia slightly more at 3.3%. At Lastly, the prevalence of painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy, again, uh, for the whole cohort, 43%, with highest number reported from Kuwait at 51%, followed by uh, Saudi Arabia, 39%, and then Qatar, 37%. So, unfortunately, more than 50% of uh, these patients were undiagnosed. When we look at the risk factors uh, for DBN, it was basically uh, defined here as uh, age, longer duration of diabetes, 
poor glycemic control, hyperlipidemia, obesity, physical activity, sorry, physical inactivity, as well as cigarette smoking. Females were less likely to develop DPN. For the painful DPN, uh, we see again uh, poor glycemic control, uh, longer duration of diabetes, physical inactivity uh, are actually known risk factors for this condition. When we look at the risk factors for the DFU, these are the presence of DBN, hypertension, as well as vitamin D deficiency. So in conclusion, uh, DPN was reported in one third of the cohort, and one in two of these uh, patients had high risk for diabetic food frustration, and alarmingly, half, half of them were undiagnosed. Painful DBN, again, was reported in one third of these patients. Also, 50% of these were undiagnosed. And the risk factors for DBN, as well as painful DBN, are poor glycemic control, longer diabetes duration, increasing obesity, hyperlipidemia, and lower physical activity. Females had a lower odds for DBN, but higher odds for painful DBN. And for increased risk of DBN, the risk factors are DBN, hypertension, and vitamin D deficiency. I would just like to acknowledge my co-authors uh, who contributed to this study and the funding that were received from Qatar National Research Fund, King Fahad Medical City, and Pfizer Gulf. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Imad. Um, I really appreciate all the speakers, all the time and effort spent in this discussion and preparation and, and presentation. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you would like to hear more and discuss more about their presentations, but because of the uh, uh, short uh, time allowed for each presentation, we can't do that, unfortunately. We will all be hearing about the results of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, abstract presentations towards the end of the Congress today. And um, I hope that you will, um, you know, have all your presentations written in a mass script and submitted in peer-reviewed journals for a better uh, discussion and sharing of the knowledge. Thank you all for your all participation. I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Tamar. Thank you so much, Dr. Huda. I really appreciate the uh, first the efforts of the uh, oral uh, the abstract committee first, with led by Dr. Khaled Dahmani, and also in the oral abstract committee uh, with uh, Dr. Ali and Dr. Huda. Uh, thank you for all the presenters for the hard work in de developing uh, this uh, manuscripts and 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 and, and, um, and results. Uh, really grateful for sharing that with us, and thank you for being here with us.